Hi. So we're going to wrap up our video lecture series um, with a final sort of thought on some of the principles of microeconomics in particular. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about consumer and producer surplus and a look at why markets can maximize social welfare. So as a brief summary and uh, wrapping up of what we've been talking about, we'll look at the market. So in its simplest terms, we look at demand and supply and we look at how they interact with each other. And what we note is that price serves to coordinate the actions of the uh, producers and the consumers such that we can maximize the use of resources in society. So price is the thing that works to coordinate and give information about what is scarce, what's not, and lets individuals decide what they want to do. So when marginal benefit is equal to marginal cost, which is another way of saying when demand equals supply, we're maximizing benefit and minimizing costs. We are thereby ensuring that the scarce resources that we have available to us are used in the best possible way. This maximizes benefit to society or something that we would call social welfare. Um, so in a market economy, and we have to, and this particular graph relates to what we would call perfect competition. So this is where we have many buyers, many sellers, perfect information, perfect property rights, easy entry and exit into the market. When we have those conditions in place, then price is going to serve to maximize social welfare. Now, one word of caution that you've probably already guessed, the real world never looks like this, and there are a lot of price and information asymmetries and uncertainty, which is to say that some people have more information than others, and they obscure that fact in order to get either a higher price or pay less than they should. Um, there's uh, uncertainty, because a lot of times we just can't quite fully price things. We don't understand what the... Um, relevant costs are and some of the relevant benefits. There's whole classes of goods like environmental goods that suffer from things called externalities. Um, we have regulations that distort prices and we have bad actors basically that can yield a whole variety of non-socially non optimum allocations in markets. But under certain types of conditions the market can yield the best welfare to society and best use the resources that we have available to us maximizing benefit to both sides. So we start with consumer surplus. Consumer surplus is the area underneath the demand curve and above the price. So in this case, if price were equal to zero for some particular good, you would take the entire area under the curve and um, you would simply, um, so the consumer surplus would be equal to the entire area underneath the curve. And so it would give you this entire area underneath demand and you would add that up and that would get you your consumer surplus. So consumer surplus is defined as the benefit the consumer receives after the costs have been paid for. And it is in a way sort of what you would think of as the profit to the consumer. So on the producer side we have the same type of thing where we have the uh, area above the supply curve but below the price uh, from which would usually be given by demand. Um, so in this case it would be this area here. So any area above the supply curve but below demand um, or below where the price that they're able to get for it is the profit that goes to the producer. And so it would be this entire area in here. And so this is just another visual way of sort of looking at profit to the producer. And so some way of kind of looking at what happens in the market. Now in this case, we're talking about having um, a whole lot of buyers and sellers in the marketplace. And so you're looking at what happens for the market for a particular good, which is comprised of a bunch of different suppliers or producers. And we're looking at what is the benefit that accrues from them selling it. And so both the consumer surplus and the producer surplus are measures of benefit or value that accrue from using a resource. Now when we combine the two concepts together, we get um, what we would call, so we can look at the total welfare of society. And in a perfectly competitive market, which is what we're drawing here, we have that the consumer surplus is the area below the demand curve and above supply. So this right here basically, so we have our supply curve and we have our demand curve here. So the consumer surplus is the area um, below the demand curve, which is here, right? And it's the area above the price line, so above the equilibrium price um, and below demand, or so below the demand curve and above the equilibrium price, that's where the consumer gets their benefit from. The producer, on the other hand, is below the equilibrium price and above supply. So it's this area here. And so that's going to be this area right in here, just like we showed. Um, so there's the consumer surplus, there's the producer surplus, and when we add it together, consumer surplus plus producer surplus 
gives us social welfare. So the total welfare to society is when you sum both sides of that market up. And graphically or visually, it's the entire area in this area right in here. And so that's how we would take a look at that. And again, the real world never really looks like this. We have many buyers um, <clears throat> to achieve this outcome. We have many buyers and sellers, perfect information, property rights, and easy entry into the market. One of the questions we can ask, okay, so one of the questions that we can ask is why does this maximize welfare? So why does having consumer surplus plus the producer surplus in a market driven economy, why does that produce the highest social welfare? So we can look at the first case where we have, um, the, so the original case is where we're going to have consumer surplus and producer surplus at a market equilibrium. So the consumer surplus is this whole area right here, defined as the area above the equilibrium price and below the demand curve. The producer surplus is going to be this whole area, which is the area below the equilibrium price and above the supply curve. So in the absence of any government intervention and if we have perfect prices and everything else, that whole area there is the producer surplus and this whole area up here is the consumer surplus. And as we can see, we have two nice big triangles that we get from having it like that. Now, let's say that the government comes in and, de and decides that for whatever market this is, that they're going to apply a producer tax. Let's say this is oil, gas, chewing gum, tobacco, corn, flour, I mean housing, it doesn't matter what it is. So assume that there is a tax that's implemented in this market. So the impact of the tax is that it forces the supply curve up because basically this increases cost to the producer. Now sometimes they offset it and you can have part of this paid for by the consumer, part of it paid for by the producer, but let's just assume for simplicity that the entire impact of this is shipped off onto the producer and that they cannot, um, because it's too competitive and some other things, they can't pass any of it on to the consumer. So in this case the supply curve is going to shift to the left. So what happens when the supply curve shifts to the left? Well, so what happens is that um, so what happens when we do that is that we end up with so we've shifted the supply curve to the left and so what that means is that we move up along the existing demand curve here so we move along the existing demand curve right here um, so here we go up along this existing demand curve to a new higher equilibrium price and quantity. So we were down here at this price. We then shift up to this price here. We were at this quantity right here. We then move back to this quantity right here. And so now what we see is that there is a decrease of this product sold in the marketplace from Q0 to Q1. The price has increased from P0 to P1. And one of the other interesting things that we see is that we have this area right here. We have this little triangle. And this is something called a deadweight loss. And the deadweight loss is something that we have, um, it's just a loss to society. It's a deadweight. It doesn't go to anybody. It doesn't go to the producer. It doesn't go to the consumer. It doesn't go to the government. This is wasted resources. And so what it does basically is it crowds out private, um, so private activity and demand and supply, and you have this amount that's lost. Now there's tax revenue that's gained, and the tax revenue um, is reflected basically by this shift here, and so you get a certain gain in tax revenue that goes to the government. So without a tax, the total welfare to society is the consumer surplus plus the producer surplus. So that's this entire triangle right here. With the tax, the total welfare to society is the consumer plus producer surplus plus the tax revenue minus the deadweight loss. So the new producer surplus, when we have this new area up here, um, so it shifts uh, this curve out, so we have a new producer surplus, which goes up here. We have a smaller consumer surplus, which is this area up in here, um, and we have this deadweight loss. And so what happens effectively with the tax is that while you have some money that goes to the government, and that's that tax revenue, and we have some that goes to consumers and some that goes to producers, we have this area which doesn't go to anybody at all. And so what we see is that by the amount of that triangle, we end up with, uh, and that graph's gotten really messy, I'm sorry. By the time we take that deadweight loss out of there, what we see is that the total welfare to society ends up being lower for having the tax put in place. And basically, what this, the conclusions that we would reach based on a perfectly, a, 
a market that operates perfectly efficiently, is that when resources are scarce, um, price serves uh, as a signal that helps coordinate buyers and sellers so that social welfare is maximized from the use of resources. Anything that distorts the price from that market equilibrium level, whether it be through taxes or subsidies, regulations, price ceilings, or price floors, creates what we would call that deadweight loss. And that deadweight loss goes to nobody. It's just lost to society. So a deadweight loss has lost value, and society would be better off by the value of the deadweight loss without the thing that's distorting the prices. And so that's part of, so total welfare is maximized under a market system with perfectly efficient prices, many buyers and sellers, and all that kind of stuff. And we see that by the ability to have, um, so that entire area here, oopsie, so we have that entire area here, um, that producer surplus and consumer surplus, that total welfare to society is that whole big triangle right there. And uh, maybe if I can make it some other color. Um, so this whole area here would be the social welfare that is without any interference in the market. And anything we do around that diminishes the total welfare to society. Um, so given that, and we have a large emphasis on sort of free market economics, laissez-faire, everything coming down from Adam Smith can be sort of really just described very simply by that graph right here and looking at the consumer surplus here and the producer surplus here. But one of the things that is not captured in that, um, and this brings us back to the fact that economics really is the science of uh, moral philosophy, as it were. So while the market framework that we talk about and you know the things that we've described um, with the simple models that we've been looking at in terms of a market and demand and supply, when we employ markets to allocate resources, we basically, it's pretty well shown that we can get the highest level of benefit to society. That is, we can maximize consumer surplus and producer surplus. We can maximize that total welfare to society. However, it is based on the one dollar, one vote type of principle of utilitarianism, which is to say, as long as the total value is maximized, that society is better off. So all we really care about is maximizing that producer and consumer surplus. Now, why is that a problem or is it a problem? And so one of the things that we could think about or investigate or that just needs to be known about the conclusion when we say markets are best is that um, producer and consumer surplus are maximized um, under a market type of model with good prices, but it doesn't matter to whom those values accrue. Hence the one dollar one vote. As long as the value is greater, then economically and from an efficiency standpoint, that's what you would choose to do. However, equity and efficiency are not the same thing. So while a, where we have consumer surplus is equal to producer surplus, we maximize welfare and we maximize the benefit that is gained from the use of any scarce resource. But this is only efficient. It has nothing to do with equity and it cannot address who or why. All it states is that the total value of the benefits is greater when you have that allocation. So while a market outcome ensures the greatest availability of an economic pie, as it were, it says nothing about how the pie is sliced up. It is possible to be very, very efficient and have a huge economic pie. But for example, you could have 400 people with 95% of the pie, and you could have 400 million people um, that are left to fight over the remaining 5% of the pie. So while a market economy can deliver the greatest value of total benefits under the one dollar one vote principle, it says absolutely nothing about how those benefits are distributed. So economics can help quantify the cost and the benefits, um, but issues of equity and distribution are merely the value judgments of the analyst. Equity is not the same thing. Equity is not the same thing as efficiency. And this is where we get into the difference between normative and positive economics, and positive economics is just fine. You just have to remember it's based on a value judgment and is not an unbiased answer. And so that is where I want to leave you in the video lecture series. I hope you've enjoyed. Thank you very much.